Hi, this is Duncan Ferguson. In this presentation, I'm going to give you an update on uh, management ideas in diabetes, uh, looking at some new concepts that are coming out, and in particular, the potential role of the ultra long acting insulin products. So I thought at first it would be best to go over some of the treatment goals for dogs and cats that have been proposed by the ALIVE group, which is uh, the Agreeing Language and Veterinary Endocrinology group that arose out of the uh, European Society of uh, Endocrinology in 2017. These ideas have been around for a long time, um, but it's worthwhile noting that this consensus has sort of written them down and uh, we, it's good to review them. Firstly, we have to always try to keep a good quality of life for the pet and the owner. That's the goal. Resolve the classical clinical signs of diabetes mellitus in the treatment. And avoid this, the extremes, that is avoid ketoacidosis, which would reflect a significant underdosage, or hypoglycemia, which would reflect a significant overdosage. And try to normalize the body condition score in the animal. Because in an animal that's insulin deficient, oftentimes their body condition score is low and insulin action will tend to help improve uh, maintaining body weight. And it's the opposite in the case of an animal that's obese with insulin resistance. This group went on to recommend uh, ways to assess treatment of diabetes um, and then recommended some sort of systematic or standardized scoring system um, of clinic using uh, assessment of clinical signs and then get to the laboratory parameters that would look at glycemic parameters in the blood interstitium or urine but having said that they said there are no good there's no good solid evidence that su suggests that reaching certain glycemic goals are correlated with a specific treatment outcome including remission which we look at in possibility, as a possibility in cats. And that um, basically, anytime you find an animal on uh, treatment that has glycemic parameters within the reference range would suggest that they're possibly being overdosed, or in the case of a cat again, possibly heading into a diabetic remission. And finally, the group wanted you to keep in mind, be appreciative of the fact that there's significant variation from day to day in glucose uh, curves, uh, or even just spot glucoses, of course, uh, that fructosamine has um, difficult uh, technical issues with regards to reliability, and therefore recommends using serial use of the same assay in the same patient to look at relative changes uh, as you treat. That would be the major way they'd use fructosamine as opposed to an initial diagnostic. Again, negative urine glucose can indicate possibly hypoglycemia in a treated diabetic. And keep in mind that comorbidities are very common in diabetes and that um, they should always be considered, particularly if you have other signs that aren't totally consistent with diabetes. And then that, again, coming back, that specific glucose targets are not a goal. Really, the clinical improvement of the animal is the primary goal of the treatment. Now, in view of these principles, uh, I thought it'd be worth also mentioning the that the availability of insulin pens um, has led to some real opportunities for improved treatment in the diabetic dog and the cat. Uh, there's only one insulin pen that's made by MSD Animal Health. That, uh, that includes porcine uh, zinc insulin, PZI insulin. Uh, and why is this an advantage? Uh, well, it's been shown in human medicine that it increases patient adherence. The injections are shown to be uh, more accurate and precise. And there, are, there tends to be less um, hypoglycemic effects and therefore a little less wasting of, of insulin and there's cost savings associated with that. Most patients as well as uh, owners consider them easier to use than drawing up the insulin from a syringe. As I said, the only approved pen in vet med 
is the caninsulin vet pen um, from MSD. And it was shown um, that this product was well, more tolerated, more well tolerated and more accurate compared to the same product being given by a traditional syringe and vial. Now, I thought it'd be worth looking at some of the uh, pharmacokinetic uh, behaviors of insulins that are given intermediate acting insulins. Uh, and what we show here on the left are the concentration of insulin and variable doses and dosing intervals. And so what we're showing is just theoretical. This is not something that you'd see in every single patient, but quite be quite variable around that. But the idea uh, of giving a, a much higher, say, a 3x dose of what's normal, you would maybe only get a 2x increase in the peak, but a much greater extension of the duration. This has been recognized for some time uh, when animals become accidentally overdosed. You know they can be hypoglycemic for quite a long while, because partially because of this reason. Um, and if you think of it the other way around, if you take a standard dose and give it more frequently, as we show here in the blue, you can see you can actually result in a relatively, uh, you get less peak, of course, because you're giving one third the amount, um, but you're getting much more even over the day uh, behavior of, or actually pharmacokinetics of the insulin. This shouldn't be a surprise, but it should also not be a surprise that it leads to less hypoglycemia as well. Now, despite all those great theoretical benefits of frequent administration of insulin, and I think we've kind of come to the idea that the standard for most of these intermediate acting insulins is twice a day for reasonable therapy, both in the dog and the cat. Um, but for many, many years, um, even before it was commercialized uh, for veterinary medicine, Protamine zinc insulin uh, was felt to be the, one of the longer acting insulins. And back 40 years ago, basically, it was being used uh, as a once a day treatment in the cat. And so um, it was notable that when Bering and Ingelheim came out with their PZI 40 units per mil product, um, they then compared the in multi center study of 276 dogs uh, looking at the product administered over six months, they compared uh, once a day and twice a day treatment using initial doses of a half to one unit per kilogram, um, at least for the SID dose. And so they noted that um, they, they basically defined their improvement as one laboratory parameter related to diabetes had to improve and one clinical parameter. And they felt like they achieved this in 72% of dogs, where 80% hadn't been treated previously, 62% had been treated with some other protocol. Uh, and notice that the difference in once a day treatment improvement versus twice a day wasn't all that significantly different. Both seemed to reduce PUPD. Uh, when it was evaluated at three months. The, uh, the final su mean successful insulin dose was 1.4 units per kilogram per day. So you can see that it, it was slowly elevated. And um, the incidence of hypoglycemia in the study was 9%. So based on this, the authors claimed that at least in theory, uh, if not in practice, uh, once a day treatment with this product uh, could be possible in that it at least showed that um, giving a larger dose once a day may get a, uh, a more prolonged action of this product of PZI. Uh, 